Okay, so now we're gonna move on to some new stuff. So we, it's called inner product. So this lecture is about inner product spaces and orthogonal system. So here before, here's a notation, define K as either a real or complex field, okay? So now we define a vector space over K, a function, okay, a function that gives two vectors to a element of K is an inner product if we have positive finite, so this is not negative, and it's zero only if and only if X is a zero vector. It's also linear in the first law, so basically we have this and is a conjugate symmetry so if you swap these two you have you're giving back the conjugate so given a vector space v and given a, a defined inner product a given function we call v and this an inner product space which is abbreviated as ips inner product space so sometimes here's a like a little note to show that x equals to y it's cool that showing x minus y is equal to the zero vector. So we can just show that their inner product is equal to zero. Okay, so when we're showing two vectors are the same. Now, here's some examples of inner product. The standard dot product is an inner product, as you could verify. And this is something interesting. So we let we the space of function spaces and we define fg as this. Okay? As this. Now it is an in product space. So something we have to verify. So the conjugate symmetry is trivial. This is this is what we need to verify in linearity. I believe it is obvious by the linearity of Riemann integral, right? So let's verify this one. Now, if we have this is equal to zero, it implies f is equal to zero. So here's the proof. Suppose f is not zero at some point. Okay? So even though f is from a, b to r, we can still take the open interval. Why? Because by the continuity of f, f is continuous and you're positive, which means that even though you're at this point, a, even though you're at a, you're positive, right? You're at a, like you're somewhere positive. Because it's continuous, it should be locally positive, right? So you can find a point such that this point is greater than is equal to uh, greater than zero. Okay. So we can just pick x now to be the open interval, not the end point. Now, because um, we know that s square is s square of x naught is strictly positive, which means that the lower integral should be uh, greater than zero, which means that the integral is not equal to zero. Okay. Well, another way to prove inspired by my prof, he said like, well, if you have a point x naught, right, then you're like locally, right, what, if you have an interval that is locally like greater than some, above some point, and your interval, uh, and then your integral is basically greater or equal to this area. I say, say f is like this, right, right, we have a, b of f is greater or equal to like, Say x naught minus epsilon, x naught plus epsilon, and this height is like lambda, then it's equal to what? 2 epsilon lambda, which is greater than 0. So something like that, you know? Okay, that's like too far away. <laughs> this is not an analysis course, okay? It's not an analysis course, it's an algebra course. Algebra, linear algebra. Okay, that's better. Let's go back to this. So here's some remarks. For v fixed, a function that takes u to uv is a linear functional on v, right? So this is like by definition, right? Linearity on the first slide. This is by definition. So this function, given v is fixed, a function that takes this is a linear functional on v, which means that it takes zero vector to zero. And if we flip it, it still gives you zero, right? Give the conjugate. And it's also linear in the second slot. So to verify it, this is equal to this, we flip it, we add the conjugate, and we split it, we split it, and we flip it back, right? And it is um, conjugate uh, homogeneity, the second slot. 
So if we want to bring this in the front, we just bring the conjugate in the front. So verify. U lambda V is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is equal to this. And for this, we just swap it back, okay? So we have linearity in the second slot. Those are some um, properties of inner product space, right? We, we define inner product, given it satisfies these three axioms. And we, given those three axioms, we have derived a bunch of, right? We, bunch of like other properties, right? So now we define the norm. When we take inner product, a function uh, with a vector, takes the inner product with itself, and we take the square root of it. Right, which we define this to be the norm of x. So we define a norm given an inner product. Well, there are like norms that is defined not on the inner product. Uh, is it? Did I take a note of it? No, I didn't. <laughs> so basically, the uh, norm if you define given a function space, right? Given a function space a b r, right? ABR because it's a compact, so every f is bounded. So to find a norm of f is equal to supremum of fx. X is in AB. Because it's compact, compact sets are closed and bounded, so it's bounded, so we have a supremum. So this is like another notion of norm. <laughs> right? But here our norm is given by a inner product. So the observations is that uh, well v is equal to zero if only v is a zero vector observation and right, you just plug in right and the lambda of u can bring we should bring the absolute value outside here's the verification this gives you this gives you this this is this right and now it takes square root on both sides and we should get boom 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 right <laughs> so we define x y orthogonal or perpendicular if their you know, product is equal to zero the dot product the inner product should get to zero. And we denote it as S is perpendicular to Y. Observation. This is true, right? And we have the important theorem called the Pythagorean theorem. Right. Um, the Pythagorean basically we all know this, right? If they're orthogonal, if they're perpendicular, then we have this. Right? And the proof is really easy. It's just by calculation. Right, just because this is zero, we cancel out, and this and those are u squared and norm v squared. Right, this is equal to this. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. So in an arbitrary vector space, given u and v, we want to write u as equal to, like maybe, maybe a constant times v. A constant times v plus w where w is perpendicular to v so here is like our thing this is v and this is w we extend v a bit or we shrink back a bit so like this if u is like that right we shrink back a bit but anyways we just multiply by a constant plus some w that is orthogonal to v okay this is like called orthogonal decomposition. Say u is equal to cv plus u minus cv. Right, u is equal to u. So we want this, we want this to be perpendicular to v. Right? This to be perpendicular to v. Well, this means that u minus cv and v is equal to zero, and by direct calculation, we see that c must be equal to this number. Right? u minus cv v equals to zero, which means that u v, right, u v, and then negative c v v, linearity on the first slot, negative c v v gives you this thing, and then you isolate c, right, you isolate c. So here's the idea, and now it gives a because it comes to our important inequality, which is called cauchy storrs inequality in the inner product space. So given an inner product space for any x, y, um, we have this inequality, cauchy storrs stands for CS, cauchy Storr. Okay, wherever the equality holds if and only if they are linearly dependent. So either one of them is zero vector, or both non-zero, where x is equal to alpha y. Okay, 
So first we have this, and the equality holds if only if they're independent, uh, they're linearly, linearly dependent. Okay, so here's the proof. Just, I just changed x, y to u, v, I don't know, it doesn't matter. If one of the vectors is zero, then equality clearly holds, right? If this is zero, one is zero, it is zero, because you're zero, this gives you zero, right? Now, if it is a linear, um, if it's a, a scalar multiple, then this should give you this, right? If u is equal to cv, right? u equals cv, so we're bringing out the c. Uh, well, we know that we can bring this, right? We can bring this out, c times this times this, right? And you distribute this, gives you this, and then from here, you bring this C inside, this becomes U, UV, right? So UV is equal to UV, right? It's the equality. <laughs> so, so if they're linearly dependent, the equality holds, okay? Now for the reverse direction, let's do the reverse direction. Now, as discussed from above, we first we to consider the orthogonal decomposition, right? Orthogonal decomposition, where u is the w is perpendicular to v, which means that um, you take the norm of this, which is the norm of this. They're perpendicular, so by Pythagorean theorem, you can split it. And from here to here, be careful that what we're doing here is that this is lambda, right? Lambda v and squared, right? Which means that you should get this and this, right? Lambda squared, you, uh, norm v squared, right? Lambda squared, norm v squared. And notice that this is non negative, so we can just like kind of like that v4, right? Times this, boom, boom gives you two and uh, why you run away right and we have this the w remains the same and this thing is greater than zero so we're going to go to this and we see that if we multiply this here we have the desired inequality and we take square root because everything is not negative we're chilling so but the key key step is from here to here from here the equality holds when w is equal to zero. If the equality holds, right, if the equality holds, then this should be equal to zero, which means that w should be the zero vector, which means that u is a scalar multiple of v. Okay? And this concludes the proof of Cauchy Schwartz. Some discussion. If we just talk about real cases, but, uh, by Cauchy Schwartz, right? Which was then this this thing, um, this thing is nothing with this, which means that if you take off the absolute value side, and then bring this in, this whole quantity is between one and negative one, right? The whole quantity is between negative one and one, where x y are non-zero vector by Cauchy short, which means that if there's a value from if this is a value from negative one, we consider their cosine value, right? There is this unique theta such that cosine theta is equal to this. And we call this theta is the angle between two vectors, right? This theta angle between x and y. This particular theta, right? We define this. Okay, so here's some. Um, Proposition of norms. So, norm, there's like four axioms of norm. If you read it through, you see that we already proved these three, right? The important ones are like a triangle inequality. Well, for the triangle inequality, notice that this is equal to this, right? And we, we split it. This gives you the real, real part, right? This plus this gives you back two times the real part. But the real part is um, less than equal to the norm, right? So we apply Cauchy's stars on this 
quantity. We apply Cauchy's Schwartz, which gives you this. From here, we see we get the square. So we take square root, we're done, right? A squared plus B squared plus 2AB. High school math, elementary school math even. So norm one to four can be used to be a list of axiom for a norm vector space. This is what I'm discussing, right? As I discussed earlier, oh, yeah, I defined here, right? I defined here. And that's what I'm saying at the beginning, right? So the reverse triangle inequality, the proof of reverse triangle inequality is by using triangle inequality, right? We have this, we use triangle inequality, it gives the result, okay? So that is some um, like, this concludes the notion of uh, in a product and norm. And now we move on. We're given a family of, or a collection of a vector. We say that it is an orthogonal system if they are pairwise orthogonal and none of them are zero vector. Okay? They're pairwise orthogonal and then none of them are zero vector. And they are said to be orthonormal if the norm is equal to one. The norm is equal to one, which means that, well, also we have this, right? So we see that we see that if you're orthonormal, then you're automatically orthogonal, right? Because this implies this, right? So secondly, start with the orthogonal system. We can always find an orthonormal system, right? Given this, we find a corresponding orthonormal system. To do this, we just let this equal to this, right? Then we see that, well, then from here, we see that y i y i uh, y i y i should be what this this at the front and this at the back, but this right this um well you're in at the front front back. Which means that this should give you um this this which is one over x i times the conjugate of one over x i right uh I apologize okay it took me two seconds to figure it out this is when when vector space over r then we're good right. Then we're good. Then we can just remove this. Right? The conjugate zero to itself and blah blah blah. Right? So this is in vector space over R. Okay, this is when vector space over R. Not over C. Not necessarily though. Like so